I invite you to join me for our scripture reading for the morning. Today we read from Isaiah chapter 9, beginning at verse 6, and then later from Deuteronomy 18. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever see it again this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, join me in prayer. Oh God, open us up. Open our eyes that we might see, open our ears that we might hear your word in the midst of these words today. Open up our hearts then, God, that we might feel. And then, O oh Lord, open our hands that we might serve. Amen. Well, the Christmas season upon us, and um, it is a sentimental time. I mean, it is, we like to think about eggnog around the fire and children in their pajamas opening up their, their presents. And um, we, we like to think about uh, Bing Crosby singing uh, White Christmas. I mean, all of that stuff. I, I just love it, honestly. It is, I look forward to it. It is the tradition of Christmas. It is so full of sentiment. It brings back all of these childhood memories and um, you know, the, all of the, the uh, marketing around us just kind of plays into it, and it all becomes a part of a, a really beautiful, um, sentimental time. But I, I just, I, I love that part. I don't, I'm not poo-pooing it. I think it's all, all uh, uh, special. But I think we have to be really careful. And we have to be careful because we'll begin to think that that is what Christmas is, um, instead of really understanding, why is it a big deal that Jesus is born? Like, who is this Jesus? I mean, if we believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the promised Messiah, um, and, and I certainly believe he is, why is that so powerful? What difference does that make? Who is this Jesus to be born? And I think we can let the sentiment sort of soften us up so, and I mean that in a good way, so that, the, that we can allow the real true power of who this Jesus is um, uh, to seep in. So um, today you heard the scripture that, let's face it, we, you know it best from Handel's Messiah, another one of those marvelous uh, sentimental uh, traditions of Christmas. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of peace. His name shall be called. Now, it's always important to remember that in, in, um, in the Hebrew and, uh, tradition, that your name is, um, it, it, it corresponds to your identity. It's not just something that you're called. It, it's who you are. Your name is who you are. It's the role you play. It's your character. It's what you're here for. And so, um, when we say his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, we're saying that's who this Messiah is. He's a wonderful counselor. He's a mighty God. He's an everlasting father. 
He's the Prince of Peace. We're going to be talking over the next four weeks about these, um, uh, who this Jesus is. And we're going to really look at four things, prophet, priest, king, and child. And those sort of, there is a loose connection between those and wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. So I want you, if, if you forget nothing else, if you remember nothing else, I want you to remember those four, those four components, prophet, priest, king, and child. And today we're going to talk about Jesus as the prophet that came. So uh, the scripture that we read from Deuteronomy that is the words of Moses. And Moses uh, uh, says, God is, is using Moses uh, to speak a word to the people. He says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people, and you shall heed just such a prophet. Uh, then um, uh, in verse 18, repeats it. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among your own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet and who shall speak them speak to them everything that I command. So what is a prophet? A prophet is one who speaks for God, right? Who, who brings a word from God to the people. I like to think of it as sort of a downward motion. The prophet is the one who speaks to the people on behalf of God. Now, sometimes we think of, of a prophet as someone who foretells the future. And um, that's because the prophets of old would, would, in a sense, foretell the future, that God has said, this is how you're behaving, and this will be the consequence for that. Um, it's kind of like a parent telling a, 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 a child, you're making a decision, and this is what's going to happen, right? So uh, that's why we think of uh, when we say something has happened that you predicted, that we said, wow, that was prophetic, meaning... Uh, you were told what the consequences were going to be and, and, uh, and you received those. Uh, the, a prophet is one who brings a word from God. Now, Israel at the time of Christ needed a word from God. And I'll have to tell you, um, in the world we live in right now, we are anxious for a word from God. In a time where truth seems pliable, where truth seems to be that which you want to say it is, regardless of any connection to anything, we are hungry for someone who will give us, um, for a wonderful counselor, for someone who will speak the truth to us in a way that we can uh, believe it and understand it and claim it. That we are, are hungry for a word from God. Now, here's the problem is sometimes we misunderstand the word, right? I mean, we've got scripture, we've got the teachings of Christ, and, and somehow, somehow we don't all hear it and we don't all appropriate it the same way. I had a funny thing happen uh, to me this week. I had a conversation with a, a pastor who was a friend, and we were kind of commiserating on what we're going to do about COVID and how we're dealing with it and all of that sort of thing. And uh, so here, here's the text message exchange. Um, he says, no idea what to do about Christmas Eve. This is hard. I say, yes, it's hard. We just have to make a decision and live with it. He responds after a little break, ugh, I have COVID, four exclamation marks. And I respond, no way, no way. You have been really careful, right? He responds after a little break, no, no, no. Hate, 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 not have, stupid autocorrect. I have, I hate COVID. He doesn't have COVID, he hates COVID. I thought, I laughed about that. I mean, there's nothing funny about having COVID, but I just thought I had jumped to this conclusion that he, because he said, I have COVID. I think what happens is we have this little autocorrect inside us that when we hear, uh, when we read a scripture or, or, um, Here's something, we, we autocorrect it to say what we want it to say, right? We interpret it so that it says what we want it to say and we don't really hear the word from God. Now, um, I will tell you that what I believe is that the reason we study scripture, the reason we work at it so hard, the reason we dig into it, 
The reason we read it as part of a community of people who have other thoughts and ideas, the reason we pray so hard, the reason we come together in worship, all of that is, is so that we will come to know the speaker of these words better, this Jesus whom we worship, and that we might more fully actually understand the word that the prophet Jesus is speaking to us. Now, let me be clear. Jesus is more than a prophet. We're going to talk about that in the weeks ahead. But first and foremost, Jesus came to give us a word from God. So what is that word? Three things quickly that I want to share with you. Here's the first word. First word that Jesus brings us is repent. Repent. Uh, I, I know that sounds kind of... Um, kind of, you know, street corner preacher. But um, it, it's, a, it's a clear word. It's time to wake up and smell the coffee. You've got to make some changes in your life. You know, the, the scripture that we use most often during this Advent season as we uh, prepare for the coming of the Messiah is the words from John the Baptist. And you're probably familiar with them. Uh, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight paths in the wilderness, Right, you know that part. Well, let me let me read to you the the entire um, the entire scripture. It goes this way: In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, "Repent, for the kingdom of God has come near." This is the one about whom the prophet spoke when he said, "The voice of one crying out in the wilderness: Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight." Repent for the kingdom of God has come near. Friends, um, you know, uh, you, you may be really comfortable in, in the life that you're living, but what the scripture tells us is that we are missing the mark. That's literally what the word sin means in scripture. It, it's translated, it means to miss the mark. We are literally missing the mark. And I'm going to be honest. I want you to take this personally. I want you to imagine Jesus looking right down through the camera to you and saying, you calling you by name and saying, man, you got to make some changes. I have seen your selfishness. I have seen your attitudes toward brothers and sisters. I have seen the way you live your life. I have seen your hypocrisy and pretense. It's time for you to make some changes. I mean, look, it doesn't sound very Christmassy, does it? It doesn't seem like that's the, the, the place that, you know, we celebrate in this season. But friends, the Advent season is a time of preparing ourselves to hear that, that message uh, from, from Christ about who we are called to be and how we are called to live. Now, um, it's funny, this, let me just say, we, this is one of those times that often we get the elbows, right? Meaning, you know, you, you're sitting there and you glance over in the, in the living room to the person you're watching this with and it's like, you hear him? This is for you. This isn't for, for him, this is for each one of us that I need to hear this message that it's time to repent. In the words of uh, the songwriter, uh, Glenn Ballard, who um, well, you'll recognize uh, the, the song by, from Michael Jackson, right? I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways. Uh, the message couldn't be any clearer. Look, each one of us, I, I hope during this season, this Christmas season, this Advent season, you'll, you'll take a look at your life and ask yourself that simple question. What, what in my life really needs to change. Because this is a time you can do it. All right, the first word that, uh, G, that the prophet, this is the prophetic tradition that Jesus comes in. The first word that the prophet speaks to us is repent. Then the question is repent like how? Like how am I, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to live? Well, the second word that, that the prophet speaks to us, that Jesus as the prophet speaks to us, is follow me. When he looked at the disciples, when he called them, he called them away from their lives and said, uh, come and follow me. Uh, live like I live. Do what I do. 
You know, um, one of the most inter interesting things about the prophetic tradition, and by that I mean how the prophets spoke in, in old, days of old, was that it wasn't just the words they said, it was that they used their whole lives as kind of a, a, a parable of, of uh, expression. Uh, I'll give you an example, the prophet Hosea. God speaks to the prophet Hosea and says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go find a woman who's a prostitute and I want you to marry her. And then he does that, uh, she, they are married, and then she goes back to her ways again. And he says, now I want you to, go, God says to Hosea, now I want you to go find her again and bring her back to you. Well, his whole, that, that whole picture of his life was to be a message to Israel that that's who Israel has been and that God is going to continue to come and, and redeem them and bring them back again. So the, the, it wasn't just the words he spoke, it was the way he lived his life that was to be a, a, a message, a word. Well, that's true. Jesus is the living word. He is the word of God. And so it's, it's his whole life that is a, a, a message to us. And so we are called to, uh, to live and love like Jesus does. Um, Albert Schweitzer, uh, the great theologian and organist and physician uh, said, he said, there are three ways you can teach a child. The first is by example, the second is by example, and the third is by example. Jesus gives us a way of life, a pattern of living that we are to step into. It's a pattern that's about service. It's a pattern that's about humility. It's a pattern about giving ourselves away. It's a pattern about embracing the outsider and marginalized. It's a, it's a, a pattern about standing up for the oppressed. It's above all a pattern about loving our neighbor. And it's a particular way of life. That we, uh, that we choose um, to live. So uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great uh, pastor and theologian, uh, wrote this in his book called um, The Cost of Discipleship. If the world despises one of the brethren, the Christian will love and serve him. If the world does him violence, the Christian will succor and comfort him. If the world dishonors and insults him, the Christian will sacrifice his own honor to cover his brother's shame. Where the world seeks gain, the Christian will renounce it. Where the world exploits, he will dispossess himself. Where the world oppresses, he will stoop down and raise up the oppressed. If the world refuses justice, the Christian will pursue mercy. If the world takes refuge in lies, he will open his mouth of the dumb and bear testimony to the truth. My goodness. You see, there is a pattern of life that we're called on uh, to follow. I, I don't know um, how many of you know who Eric Liddell is. You probably know the movie, Chariots of Fire, which was about him. Uh, in the 1924 Olympics, he, uh, uh, he was a Scottish uh, runner, ran for um, Great Britain, and he chose to um, not run in the finals of the 400 four by 100 or four by 400 relay because it was on a Sunday. And um, he uh, w went back to, he grew up in China as the uh, children of missionaries. He went back to China and um, taught a school there. And then when World War II came, the Japanese invaded uh, and, and captured, conquered that area where um, Liddell was living. And he went into an internment camp. Uh, there, a civilian internment camp, and uh, was, was there until he died of a brain tumor just before um, the liberation of, of, uh, from Japan. But uh, what he was so well known for was not just refusing to run. He was so well known for the way that he lived in that internment camp and how he continued to teach the children and continued to lift up and buoy everyone. And uh, so he, he wrote a couple of little pamphlets and then he wrote a, a, um, a manuscript that was never published while he was alive. And many decades after he died, um, some of those who had been with him in the internment camp had those manuscripts and had them published. And there's just this one sentence in it uh, or section in it that really uh, spoke to my heart. 
He says, the, uh, the, the book is called The Disciplines of the Christian Life. He called it actually a manual of Christian discipleship. Here's what he says. You will know as much of God and only as much of God as you are willing to put into practice. <laughs> if, if you really want to know God, you've got to choose to live a different way and practice it. Follow me. There is a pastor um, named Scott McKnight. He's a professor of New Testament, and he, um, he has been really involved in trying to reach younger Christians. And uh, he, he's, he talks about why it's so difficult to convince young people that they, uh, that, you know, the days of, well, my parents were Christian, so therefore I ought to be Christian, are past. And, and he talks about why it's so hard to convince them to, to become followers of Jesus. And here's what he says. I thought it was so funny. He says, um, the, reason is, the reason is simple. It's because those who are following Jesus aren't really following Jesus. Here's what he says. Those who aren't following Jesus aren't his followers. It's that simple. Followers follow. And those who don't follow aren't followers. To follow Jesus means to follow Jesus into a society where justice rules, where love shapes everything. To follow Jesus means to take up his dream and work for it. The prophet's word to us in, in Jesus is live like this. This is how you live. You've got to make some changes, repent, and live and love like I live and love. That's our mission statement here at St. Luke's. All right, there's one more word though I don't want us to miss. And, and that word is, is a word of hope. Um, you know, the scripture said that we read a minute ago, said that, that, um, that God would raise up a prophet like Moses. Well, here, here are the words that, um, that Moses says in, in Exodus 6. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm with mighty acts of judgment. Look, the third word is, I will redeem you. It's a word of hope. You see, when, when we think of Jesus as the living word, we mean his whole life is the living word right? Not just the way he, he lived all the way up to the cross, but the fact that he's resurrected. The fact that he, he, he will not, that God will not give up on us. That God will redeem us and make it right. Even when we fall short, I don't know how many times I have looked through my own prayer journal and seen my, my confessions and my repentance. And I look and I think, I'm here saying it again. I'm, I'm repenting of the same sins that I have sinned before. And I just can't seem to, to change. God, I, I don't know what to do. Have you thought that maybe? Have you, have you wondered if there is a, if there's any way it can be different? Well, the word from God to you is this. I will not give up on you. And my steadfast love will be with you when you sin and when you don't. I, I, I love you and I will redeem you. That's my promise. During this sentimental time, when our hearts get softened, I hope you'll, you'll put aside for just a little while and take the time to, to take a look at your life, to know that the prophet came to show us how to live, to challenge us to change, to actually follow him and live and love like he lived and loved, knowing that in the end, he's got us in the palm of his hand and will redeem us. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you that your son came to us as the prophet. 
the prophet who is the word from you. And that is a, a word of challenge that we might repent and change our ways. A, a, a model for us to live our lives by. A way to shape our lives to follow your son, Jesus. And we thank you, God, that as we strive, empowered by your Holy Spirit to do just those things, we know that you will not give up on us. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.